Hello. Thank you all for coming. This is actually a much better turnout than I expected, given the, uh, the slot and uh, given that it's the second day of the conference. Um, my name is Vlad Galu. I'm VP of Engineering for GlobalSign. Uh, we're happy to support uh, the Go UK conference for the second time um, in a row. Um, I'll try to tell you as much about our company uh, to get some context and not make it too much of a, of a vendor pitch. Um, it's basically the story of something we started three years ago um, when we decided that Pierre was going to towards a dead end and we decided to do something about it. Um, if you wonder what a global sign is, you're perfectly entitled to wonder. Uh, we're a certificate authority, um, currently the number three in the world. Um, we are a web trust certified body of that sort. And you probably have not heard of us directly, or maybe you have in, in passing. Uh, we are a provider's provider. We do not generally have a direct relationship with individuals or with any kind of end users. We um, enable other people like the Facebooks or Yahoo's of the world to, um, to offer the services they offer to you. Um, you probably use this today. Um, if you have um, an Office 365 um, subscription like at work, um, you, you have spoken to one of our servers um, directly or indirectly. Um, these are the, our traffic stats for, well, our request stats for the current month. Um, it used to be a lot more um, before Let's Encrypt picked off. Um, back at, about a year ago, the scale would be about five times larger. Two years ago, it would be about 20 times larger, uh, around hard bleed um, when lots of uh, certificates were revoked. Um, we pushed out a lot of traffic. Luckily, we partnered with our friends at Cloudflare, so they take most of the hit for us. However, um, if we can't uh, deliver those responses to them in about four hours, then everybody's in trouble. So we generally fly very, very low under the radar until we mess things up, as we did in October last year when we uh, transferred the ownership of one of our routes um, and then cross-signed that certificate, revoked uh, our part, and then due to bugging our OCSP responder, about a quarter of the internet, or sorry, the web, um, went offline. Um, so that's roughly the scale of the, of the web we, we cover for now. Um, about three years ago, um, I joined GlobalSign as the first technical employee in the West. Um, most of the engineering division was based in Japan, where the uh, HQ is. Uh, the remit was to um, refocus the company um, into a new direction. Um, as I said, Let's Encrypt is picking up a lot of the domain validated SSL, uh, which we think is great. Uh, they're doing a great job. They have done a fantastic job at lowering the bar for everyone to get certificates onto their servers of any kind. Um, the one question we always get is, um, so is Let's Encrypt killing you? And we always go, uh, not really. Um, before they picked up um, the DV SSL work, um, we were not making that much money from DV anyway. That's a very, very low uh, paid service. Uh, what we do better uh, as a commercial CA is extended validated um, certificate certification where we actually inquire the whereabouts of the company, asking for the certificate, whether or not the person in the company asking for the certificate is entitled to ask for a certificate so that you don't have, you don't go as a contractor at Google, ask us for a certificate, we give you one and then uh, Bob's your uncle. So uh, we have looked at other areas where PKI makes sense. And um, one of those, well, the main area for that type of thing is IoT, which I know lots of people consider to be a buzzword. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But we work with um, uh, partners from the industrial side of IoT. So for instance, um, oil and gas, automotive, and healthcare. Um, and they they tend to build their devices at a much, much higher quality grade than the people who brought you the Mirai botnet. Um, so <laughs> they, they, they look for a few things mainly. Um, 
The first thing is for each device to have its unique identity, um, and then that is used either in a, in a private trust model within the swarm of a, of a single vendor, or in a sort of federated fashion where multiple vendors have devices that talk to each other as part of a larger system, such as in a car where you have different components from different sources. Um, authenticity of components can be also enforced through digital identity uh, enrolled onto these devices. Um, ultimately, if one of those components, let's say in oil and gas, you have um, intelligent sensors attached to, to scatter systems at, in the oil fields next, attached to the drilling pump, um, if you know how to connect to them now, you can shut them down. So uh, uh, it's not, it doesn't look too good. Um, so um, everyone wants to be able to quarantine such a device if it turns out to uh, as, as compromised in any way, like stolen, lost, hacked into. Um, we have some we've had some challenges. I think I like to think that we have addressed the, the worst of them. Um, the first one is um, the ease of use, as you probably know. Um, PKI is not the most marvelous environment to work with. Uh, the PKI protocols are binary. Um, they were designed in the 90s. <laughs> they still work, um, but everyone would rather use something else. So what we've done has been to uh, completely hide that ugliness and complexity at the very bottom of our stack and expose a very lightweight and user-friendly, uh, developer-friendly API to, to our partners to um, boost their creativity and productivity. Uh, the other component we have, we have had in mind is scalability. Um, between all of the main CAs, including us, in the public internet, on the web, there are about 30 million certificates in existence, so that's not a whole lot, but um, in IoT we're talking billions, so all of our partners are thinking of rolling out initial batches of a million devices or two million or five million devices, all of which need a unique identity when they leave the factory. So that poses other challenges for us. They will get those identities in real time or near real time from us, but they need to get them. We need to guarantee that because if we stop, then the assembly line stops. So they can't push those out fast enough. Um, we have some, the way we operate, we, given that we are a web trust um, conformant organization, means we, we operate in a very, very adverse system. Um, if you take um, all the gunfight, all the um, supercars and supermodels out of that, you end up with us. Um, all of our infrastructure is um, in a secure suite, and inside that secure suite, there's another secure cage where all of our uh, crypto material lives, and that is not remotely accessible. So, um, one, we have a very finite uh, re physical real estate where we need to operate our own hardware infrastructure. So, infinite horizontal scalability is not a thing. Um, it's not as easy as spinning up some more AWS instances. Um, and uh, secondly, if things go bad, someone needs to go to the data center and access to the data center is subject to <laughs> a book about this thick, <laughs> about role separation and uh, mutual verification within the same organization. The point being, you don't want any rogue employees acting on out of their own volition, going in uh, with elevated rights and doing bad things. Uh, last but not the least, um, we generate a lot of data because we need to demonstrate compliance quite a few times every year. Um, and every issuance of every certificate generates on average about 10, maybe 15 um, events that all need to be logged. More often than not, nobody looks at them, but if one bad thing happens, we need to, to have them around. So. We have um, a huge scalability problem that needs to be addressed with finite physical resources. So we need to be very creative about solving these problems. Um, we have this step scaling model um, where we 
um, build something to a certain performance level, and we do that by very rigorous, rigorous initial measurement. We know what the load we want to sustain is, and we optimize it. We optimize the platform until we reach it, and then if we need ten times more than that, we will extrapolate and say we'll we'll need about ten times this much hardware. But every single time we see a performance dip because the volume grows, we would first look at um, vertical. Um, scaling first through algorithmic optimization. Um, hardware upgrades, whenever we, we buy servers, um, we have some headroom for CPUs, for RAM, for, for disks, so we would do that first. Um, it's a lot cheaper for us and saves up on real estate. And if, and only if, that doesn't do it, um, we look at horizontal scaling, so we add more racks. Now, None of our legacy systems back in the day were fit for this sort of task because, as with most PKI companies, the stacks were designed in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, very, very different times. Nobody ever thought PKI would possibly get this big. Um, so we had to, to redo it from scratch. And that's literally how we started this project, without a single line of code in place. Um, and to that end, we had to look at the load we would have and turned out that most of it was going to be IO bound and three years later that is that has been confirmed tenfold. Um, and we started shopping for a, for a programming language to use. Um, we've looked at a few back then, uh, Scala had, was picking up but we could not find five pe people who wrote Scala the same way. <laughs> and we were not too big fans of the JVM. We were comfortable with it, but you know, just comfortable, not fans. Um, Rust was, I think, the Rust spec was at 0 0.8. And with my C++ background, I had one look at the Rust memory model and I thought, well, I've done some complicated stuff, but that looks unnecessarily complicated. <laughs> uh, if we were to, to, to grow it fast, we needed something simple. So uh, we obviously looked at Go, um, not knowing much about it. Um, I would say the things that were most important to us are basically these. Static typing. Um, in our line of work, we do want to catch a whole class of errors at compile time, if possible. Um, the memory model is good. Uh, we were not that used to automatic memory management, so we said, well, okay, let's give it a go, see, see how it works for us, but not knowing what to expect. Turned out um, it works well, even though we still do judicious, judicious resource allocation. We pool everything. Uh, we try to talk to the GC as, few, uh, as, as little as possible. It's also reasonably fast. We didn't need raw C speeds for what we do. As I said, we are mostly IO bound. But, and it's also very easy to learn. Everyone who has been around the C family of languages can pick it up. And, no time. Um, it's not the language that you need to get used to, but the uh, but the tooling more more. So everybody speaks about the, the mythical week of getting used to Go. I think that's mostly getting it to run and running your first hello world and do it, running your first web service that says hello world, basically. <laughs> um, as I said, being a highly I/O driven uh, company, um, we all and. Having that sort of background, um, we, we love event-driven programming patterns. Um, back in the day, we all submitted bugs to ePoll, KQ, Dev, Paul, and Solaris. So uh, we were not really looking at doing that again. So uh, we love the fact that the Go runtime has the NetPolar, which solves that all nicely for us. Um, the only <coughs> Algorithmically complex uh, things we do, so the crypto load is handled um, by dedicated um, TIPS certified hardware. Um, we generally, well, we both like and don't like that, if that makes sense. Um, it's all proprietary, so there's that feeling of control is not there. But at the same time, um, what you see is what you get. Um, the uh, product sheets in that world are very, very accurate. If a product says you'll do 30 signatures a second, that's exactly how much you'll do. So it's very easy to, to predict, it's very easy to budget. And we interface with that type of hardware through the C libraries they provide, which 
we don't have to work that hard to, to call from Go. Uh, thankfully, there is someone very kind in the Netherlands that, who wrote a very good P11 wrapper for Go, which we use extensively. So, job done, we chose Go, and then we saw this. Um, we had a look at the ecosystem, and we had absolutely no idea what frameworks to pick. There's a, there's a repo on GitHub called Awesome Go, which has this huge list of awesome Go things. If you look under each section, um, there at least, there's at least 10, 15 of everything. Um, so web frameworks, API frameworks, routers, uh, logging subsystems, uh, config formats. We had no idea what was best. So uh, we had to spend a few months, well, yeah, months trying to figure what works best for us because some of these uh, libraries are more opinionated than others. Some give you a lot of control but not enough out-of-the-box functionality. Some of those, there are others who go the opposite. So in, for every business, um, there's always going to be this exercise of finding your sweet spot. Um, about 1999, I think, um, a man called Eric Raymond um, wrote an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. I was 17 at the time, and I thought, what's with this philosophy stuff? Um, didn't weigh too much for me at the time, but now I get it. Um, so in this essay, he was uh, describing two software development models, um, the cathedral mode, which at the time represented um, the GCC compiler, was this top-down approach where you have a Jedi Council, which works on something and then for a while and then shares it with the world. Um, whereas the bizarre model is the opposite. It's, it's a bottom-up model where every, everyone works on something that they deem useful to them and perhaps to others. Then they share with the community and somehow, some, somewhere, someone integrates that. Um, and it is our feeling that that's exactly how the Go ecosystem works at the moment. Um, certainly the amount of choice can be daunting. Um, some assembly will be required. Um, and in maybe five out of seven situations, you'll need to do some bits yourself. And also, don't become too attached to anything you like because it might not be there tomorrow. Uh, it's happened to us a few times. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit about finding people to work for you in, in Go. Um, I love Venn diagrams. Um, they can explain everything, including Venn diagrams. Um, I think there are mainly three types of people. People who want to build what you build. So for instance, people generally know what they like to work on. It's either back end, front end, and in those main categories you have some subcategories. Some people want to do trading, some people want to do uh, infrastructure, content delivery, anything. Um, and that's more likely to be the larger set if, if you do something with wide reach. Uh, and then you have the people who want to use Go. Uh, there, well, the categories I've just mentioned can be pretty much covered in any other language, but some people do want to use Go. Out of those in the blue set, only a few really want to use Go. Some of them, for some of them, it's just a passing curiosity. Um, they try it while getting paid, and then they decide it's not for them, and they go back to their comfort zone, whatever that might be. And last but not the least, you have the people who want to work for you. So if you're not a household name company, then good luck. <laughs> I guess for us the takeaway has been, uh, from the position we are in, uh, this, this large company you've never heard of, uh, or nearly never heard of, is that if, if you work on something cool, you need to, to get the word out there, to let people know. Um, and then out of those people who want to use Go, some of them might want to come work for you. Um, looking back at our decisions, uh, we, I, I, I don't think a single week passes without us thinking whether we've made the right choice, choice or not. And the answer is always unanimously yes. Um, some bits have been painful, uh, but on average, I think um, the benefits mass have, for us at least, have massively outweighed 
uh, the disadvantages. Um, we started this from one person that just happened to be me at the time. Uh, <clears throat> so um, prototyping a new platform, thinking about the architecture, assessing third-party technologies, um, while scheduling interviews, meeting people, and then getting them on board with the very vague thing that you've just started working on um, is a challenge that I think most greenfield projects have, or many startups have, and for that type of situation, we think Go is an extraordinary choice. We also love the tooling. Um, who here has had an argument, heated or not, about the best editor for code? Yeah, quite a few people. How many of you are very, very fond of your key combinations in your editor? <laughs> so, <laughs> the fact, we one of the things we love about Go is that um, a lot of um, editors, a lot of IDs, they all resort to the same underlying tools, which makes uh, everyone happy. We've never had a single um, debate in the office about the editors to use. Dom right there changes editors every week. I have, I only know about it because someone else tells me, but I wouldn't know if I looked at our commit log or, yeah, it, it's never, it never comes up. Um, the tooling seems to be a very good con common denominator for everyone in every company. Um, we have found that you still need to enforce a good coding discipline. You can write bad code with Go just as you can with um, every other language. Early on, we instated a few unnegotiable rules about how we organize code. Uh, simple things that let people who do not have the best ID find their way around the code. So for instance, in every module, we'd have this rule that you have, you first define the types, and then you have the costs, and then you have the vars, and then you have everything else, which makes parsing every file visually a lot quicker. It makes a lot more sense. Also, things like avoiding uh, variable shadowing. I think the linter is a lot better these days, but three years ago it wasn't, and we it's a reflex for us to not use the the colon initialization, but yeah, it still helps, keeps the code readable. Um, we used to do a lot of stuff ourselves uh, for a few reasons. Um, Steve Francis' keynote yesterday was very relevant for this. What he said was that. Uh, for many things, um, Google has been in this uh, echo chamber and then they, they've only assessed what people needed from Go from their own perspective. Uh, there's a lot of code in the standard library that has been there for the longest of time, but it's still private. Uh, a lot of that is in the crypto package, which is what we're very interested in. <laughs> so <laughs> in some situations, we literally use that or we re-implemented some, some, some of those things uh, to a larger extent ourselves because we, we needed to. Um, we also did our own um, buffer pooling for anything HTTP we consume and um, uh, return a lot of JSON. Uh, for us, adding extra buffering improved the API throughput by a factor of five, uh, around Go 1.5. Um, and then someone decided to add sync pool um, buffering to net HTTP, so we don't we, we, we could clean all of our code uh, in a quick sweep. Vector.io, uh, it's gonna, I think is going to be out in uh, Go 1.9 in a few days. Um, Subtests, we initially went with one testing framework, which was a lot along the lines of um, XUnit, where you had a test suite where you initialized some state and then you had tests that had their own state and you had hooks pre and post tests. Uh, I think one more important point to make is that um, although Go doesn't try to be all things to all people, it is a lot of things to us. Um, we are not language purists. Um, we just appreciate what it does for our business. Um, it does a lot. As I said, um, we've had worse tools at hand that still worked. We, we are just happy with what we have. Anything that comes in Go2, we'll happily use, but um, we're not too fussed if not all of that. Uh, I'm just think, oh, sorry about this. Now, about 
the ecosystem. Some advice we've been giving each other in the team, um, and it, it would sound too pretentious to, for us to try and give anyone else advice, but friendly recommendations. Um, if you care about a, a project, a package, and if it doesn't quite work for you, uh, please do report or try to fix the bug. That helps. Um, it might, someone else might, but not today, not tomorrow, in a month, and you'd rather do it today. If you see that a project is falling out of maintenance, do volunteer to, to maintain it. Um, we've had to do that a few times. Um, there were some critical components to what we do, uh, where we have found that we needed to learn that bit more about this database or about the SKU to, to, make thing, to keep things working. Also, if you're already a maintainer and you got bored of your thing, please do re uh, relinquish main maintainership to someone else who wants to do it. Uh, don't be stubborn, basically. <laughs> um, more importantly, if your business relies on, on things written in Go, and if they do not, um, if they're not a competitive advantage for you, by all means, please do open source them. Um, we will put our money where our mouth is in a few weeks. Um, we're planning to, uh, to put some code on GitHub before the conference, um, but as we are launching a new service this Monday, um, that has had to wait until we can polish it and publish it in a shape that we can be proud of. Um, the point being, if your business relies on it, you'll always be around to, to look after it, so it has a much better chance of survival. Um, ultimately, if you use it on anything else other than Linux, please do uh, try it out. Um, again, report bugs. Um, we are a hybrid Linux BSD shop. It, it's mostly the same, but there's that 0.1% of cases that are not quite the same. So, yeah, that's been all from GlobalSign. Thank you once again for coming, and hopefully we'll see you next year.